Okay. So we've just uh, reviewed the exam solution. If you want to stop by during my office hours, if you have any specific questions about your exam paper, feel free. Um, I do have a couple of academic advising appointments today, but the majority of my office hours are open this afternoon and the rest of the week. Um, homework 11 is due on Friday. That's the assignment that has some hydraulic jump problems. We're going to continue talking about hydraulic jumps today. And then class next Monday is online in case anybody besides me wants to go and look at that eclipse. So class next Monday, I'll put a recorded video online for you and I'll email you the link to that. Uh, so on the project, um, as I was mentioning just a moment ago, half the points are available at the final submission. So what you need to do is make corrections on your demand estimation. For example, if I saw that you got anything other than a perfect score on demand estimation, when I'm grading your final submission, I'm going to go back and I'm going to look at like what were my concerns with your demand estimation during your initial submission. And then I'm going to look to see if you made corrections and adjustments, if you enhanced your flow rate estimates. Same thing with the, uh, the pipe optimization. If you got anything other than a perfect score, my plan is I'm going to go back and look at what were my comments about your initial pipe design, and then did you make improvements? And uh, did you get it right for the final submission? So the final submission is supposed to be more than just uh, copying what you've already submitted. You know, these draft submissions are meant to be opportunities for further improvement. Some people got it exactly right the first time around, but most of us won't when we're doing something for the first time we don't generally achieve perfection that very first time. So um, that is what I wanted to mention about the, uh, the final submission is that uh, the pipe sizes have costs associated with them. That's provided in the handout, the cost of each pipe size. And so your final um, project submission should have an estimate of what the cost of the project is going to be in terms of the cost of the reservoir and the cost of the pipe installation. Okay, any questions related to the announcements? Some people do a really nice job on the uh, exams being like linear and logical and easy to follow. And some people just work all over the page in no particular order, like they'll work up the top left then the bottom left and they're just not as linear and logical. So my recommendation is, you know, think about in English, we read from left to right and from top to bottom. And try and lay out your solution following that same kind of linear logical development so that uh, you think of it as a proof, you know, like your solution should be well organized. And it'll make it easier to give people partial credit, more partial credit, if the solution has kind of like an underlying rationale. Okay, let's talk about hydraulic jumps. Um, remember that a hydraulic jump is when Supercritical flow comes up upon conditions where it can't be maintained because the slope is a subcritical mild slope. So if you had water which picked up a lot of velocity down a spillway or down a steep channel segment and then it encounters a mild channel segment, the water's going to have to go through a hydraulic jump. And we talked last time about the momentum depth diagram and that on a momentum depth diagram, we can find out what are the sequent depths to the supercritical step. So what would be the downstream after it goes through the hydraulic jump? What would be the new depth downstream? So remember in that example with Excel, we created a momentum depth diagram <coughs> and showed how it's a little bit different from a specific energy diagram. And we illustrated how to calculate sequent depths. The other way, besides the graphical technique, to calculate sequent depths is with the Bellinger momentum equation. Now, we didn't actually do some calculations with that yet. So let's give it a try. I'm going to pause from talking. We have a rectangular channel that I'd like you to find Y2. Find the downstream depth. And to do it, you're going to have to assess what's the Froude number upstream. So what's the Froud number at 1? This is a rectangular channel, so you can either use the full version of the Froud number equation, or since we have a rectangular channel, you could use this abbreviated approach for finding the Froud number upstream. But use it to find Y2. 
And then the second component of this example is asking, what's the fraction of the initial energy that was lost? And so that's a two-step process. First of all, you're going to find delta E. But you're going to find more than L delta E. You're going to find out what is the, uh, the fraction of lost. And so what that means is, for the second part, find delta E. And then also find um, delta E relative to how much energy there was at 1. So that will tell you the uh, fraction of initial energy which is lost. All right. So get out your calculators. Calculate y2 with the Bellinger momentum equation. Okay, so for the y2, we start by calculating the flow per unit width, 13.085 meters squared per second. And you can use that to determine the Froude number upstream. So it is definitely supercritical, which if you did the Froude number calculation and it wasn't supercritical upstream, then there won't be a hydraulic jump. So there, the only way you can have a hydraulic jump is if you've got supercritical flow conditions upstream, and we do have that. If we use the full version of the Froude number equation, get the same value, and plugging it into the <coughs> Bellinger momentum equation, that suggests that the downstream depth is going to be 5.956 meters. And so this is a pretty dramatic jump. It's going from less than one meter in depth up to nearly six meters in depth. So it's going to be dissipating a tremendous amount of energy with such a transition. Anybody else get that same 5.9 meters value? OK, good. The energy loss part of it, just putting it into the formula for delta E, then that says that um, the, the amount of energy that's lost is 6.45 meters of energy. And then how much energy was there originally upstream? If we have the depth and the velocity head, those are the two components of the energy at one. And we could put the velocity head in terms of q squared divided by 2ga squared. Uh, there's a way that we've used a lot recently where it's flow per unit width squared in the numerator for the velocity head. Here, I just use the traditional v squared divided by 2g. So um, having calculated the velocity in the first part, I just used that to find that we had originally at one 12 point 66 six meters of energy and if we're losing 6.45 then that means that about 51 percent of the energy that was initially present upstream when the water was flowing supercritical 51 percent of that energy got lost through the hydraulic jump so we can definitely see energy is not conserved through a hydraulic jump although momentum may be So on the homework assignment, you're asked to use some of these same formulas. Just you know, find the new downstream depth given some upstream depth, which is associated with supercritical flow conditions. <coughs> find out how much energy is lost through the jump using this delta E formula. Does anybody have questions about the example? Now. This example we just barely worked, the channel was rectangular. Trapezoidal channels are a little bit more tricky. Remember, part of the momentum depth diagram that we created in class on Friday is uh, we were multiplying the cross-sectional area by the depth to the centroid, h bar. In a rectangular channel, the depth to the centroid isn't as simple as just um, the flow depth divided by two. That's what we did for a rectangular channel is for a rectangular channel, the center of the area is just one half of the depth. But for a trapezoidal channel like this, then the depth of the centroid is going to be less than halfway down because the side area brings up the average uh, above the halfway point. So I wanted to share this formula with you. Uh, this formula says that 
if you know there's a certain flow depth Y, and you know the top width, capital B, and the bottom width, lowercase b, then the distance from the bottom of the channel up to the centroid is associated with this formula. So just to show you how it would work for this trapezoidal channel, which we're looking at, which has a 3 meter bottom width, a 1 meter flow width, a 1 meter flow depth, and then 1 to 1 side slopes. So to, uh, to calculate the, uh, the depth to the centroid, for this example we've got the lowercase b, the bottom width is 3 meters, uh, the top width, if, if the flow depth itself is one meter, then that means there's also one meter on the side on the right and one meter on the side on the left. And so the top width is going to be five meters. Can everybody see that just kind of by inspection that it's five meters across the top if you've got three meters on the bottom and then one meter on each side. So, um, to calculate the area, then it's Y times B plus capital B divided by two. So, our depth of flow was one meter, the bottom width was three meters, plus five meters <coughs> divided by two. So, the, uh, the flow area here is four meters squared just to have that, because typically if we're creating a momentum depth diagram, we'd need to know the depth of the centroid and the area. So there's our area. Um, the formula we have is the distance up to the centroid. And that's different from the depth down to the centroid. We can correct pretty easily, but just to emphasize that what we're calculating from this given formula is going to be the flow depth 1 meter 2 times capital B so 2 times 5 meters plus lowercase b which is 3 meters and then in the denominator of the formula 3 times 5 meters plus 3 meters okay so that tells us that it's 0.5417 meters from the bottom upward to the centroid. So the distance from the bottom to the centroid, that is 0 0.5417. And so then what we want to know, h bar is just going to be y minus this value that we've found. And so it is 1 meter minus 0 0.5417 meters. And so the distance from the surface of the water down to the centroid, 0.4583 meters. So this is useful to you if you have to create a momentum depth diagram for a trapezoidal channel. This approach for calculating the depth of the centroid. Because you'll remember that when we uh, created these momentum depth diagrams last time, it was the area multiplied by the depth of the centroid, h bar. So now you've got the tools you need to calculate h bar for a, a trapezoidal channel. Any questions before we move on from that? Okay. Hydraulic jump locations. Um, ideally, there won't be any gradually varying flow before a hydraulic jump occurs. On Friday, I introduced the idea that a hydraulic jump, we call that rapidly varying flow. It's where the flow depth goes through a very rapid transition to a shallow depth to a deep depth. And um, the ideal case is when the channel downstream of the hydraulic jump just coincidentally has the same flow depth as described by Manning's equation. You know, like if you've got a certain flow rate, a certain roughness, a certain slope, then the tail water, meaning the water after the hydraulic jump, the tail water is going to have some depth. Well, 
Sometimes, although not often, but sometimes, just coincidentally, the tailwater depth exactly matches the depth that is going to be caused by a hydraulic jump, which, you know, you can see this is the hydraulic jump that's been formed by an underflow gate. Like this gate caused the water level to rise a bit more than it normally would, and then the water's going under the gate with a high velocity but a low depth. So this gate forced supercritical flow on a mild slope. And supercritical flow cannot be sustained on a mild slope for long. And so it immediately goes through that transition. And the reason why it immediately goes through the transition instead of gradually getting a little bit deeper before it goes through the transition is it immediately jumps because it's at the sequence of the downstream depth. Remember, a hydraulic jump has to kind of like match, it has to go through the transition and find a downstream depth that has the same amount of momentum that it did upstream. So sometimes, in other cases, the water is going to gradually get deeper and deeper until it finds that amount of momentum that also exists downstream. So here, um, <coughs> I wanted to point out, you can see here in red, I'm saying there's new variable definitions. And specifically, y prime 1 just means the depth after the hydraulic jump. Our book, for whatever reason, when it was talking about pooling upstream of an obstacle, it used pri y prime 1 to describe the new depth that water will pool to after an obstacle. But here, they're saying that y prime 1 is the conjugate depth downstream of a hydraulic jump. So in the Bellinger momentum equation, it says like y1 and y2, where y1 is upstream of the hydraulic jump, y2 is downstream of the hydraulic jump. But somewhere along the line, our book, when it's talking about the tailwater and the relationship between hydraulic jump location and the tailwater capacity, it starts using y1 to mean upstream and y prime 1 to mean downstream. So I think it's something that we can all keep track of, but um, you just have to be aware that suddenly now y prime 1 has a different meaning than it's had in the past. But here's the thing. This downstream depth is dictated by Manning's equation. And we could make a graph, we could make a, a figure that has a curve that's showing for a certain depth and a certain flow rate what that depth is going to be. So a tailwater rating curve is just a graph of the flow rate versus depth for this slope, for the channel geometry, for the roughness. And so here is a Q on the horizontal axis, depth on the vertical axis, and you could make a graph of the tailwater. That's a graph of the uh, Manning's equation relationship that's talking about the stream after the hydraulic jump. But you could also make a graph of the hydraulic jump itself. So what would be the depth of the hydraulic jump for a certain flow rate? So in the ideal case, the hydraulic jump curve is right on top of the tailwater curve. And this may not make sense to you until I show you the next figure. I think when you see the next figure, then you'll understand why sometimes these two curves on, aren't on top of each other. So this is where I think things will make more sense, is the, the hydraulic jump went through a period of gradual variation. So originally, in this first figure, it just immediately, like when it finished contracting after the underflow gate, then it immediately jumps. In this next case, the jump is further downstream from the gate. So the jump ran away from the gate, so to speak. And the reason why it did is because if it was going to jump immediately, then it would need to jump up to this tall depth. Because you already know from momentum depth diagrams or from the Bellinger momentum equation, if you have a really small y1, then you'll have a really big y2. right? So here, this is a pretty small depth. And this is what it would jump up to if it jumped immediately. But the tailwater isn't that deep. The tailwater, just because of the slope, 
the width of the channel, the roughness of the channel, the tail water is flowing at Y2. So that channel downstream is supporting this depth. And so you can't have it jump immediately if it's not that deep downstream. So what the water does is since it, it can't jump immediately, it gradually varies until it finally approaches this depth, which is associated with the downstream depth, which is governed by Manning's equation. So the reason why it went through a period of gradual variation is it was just waiting until the momentum in the flow was equal to the momentum downstream in the tailwater channel. So this jump moving downstream is associated with the tailwater normal depth is less than the conjugate depth of the hydraulic jump if the hydraulic jump occurred immediately. But the two are equal, like it is in equilibrium now if it goes through this period of gradual transition. So if we're going to draw another diagram of the rating curve of the tailwater, so tailwater means the channel downstream. So we could draw some graph of flow rate and depth. This hydraulic jump that would normally form if it went immediately, it has more depth for a certain flow capacity. So that the jump curve is above the tailwater curve. So what that means is that the jump will move further away from the gate until it finally does reach that condition where the momentum matches the downstream momentum. So whether a jump moves downstream or upstream, in both cases what it's doing is it's just looking to find where is the same amount of momentum so that it can have that hydraulic jump. So this is the jump moving downstream. Here's the case if the jump moves upstream and drowns the gate. So our ideal case is like it just immediately went through the hydraulic jump. But what if, if the channel has less capacity than the hydraulic jump? So if, if the channel isn't very steep, or if it's very rough, or if it's pretty narrow, there could be a variety of reasons where just the tailwater is deeper than it should be for the hydraulic jump. Like the hydraulic jump ideally wants to go through this transition and match up with this depth based on the gate position. But the downstream depth is actually more than what the hydraulic jump is looking for. So in a case like that, they say that the, the hydraulic jump becomes submerged. And in a case like this, you may not actually even see the hydraulic jump. It could be under the tailwater and uh, in a case like that, it's because the tailwater for a certain flow rate has a greater depth than the hydraulic jump. So the tailwater is drowning the jump. So those are some of the basics. And my suggestion is read through the book where it's describing this. And in your mind, just kind of logically go through the step by step of like, what would cause the jump to run away from the gate? What would cause the hydraulic jump to be fully submerged by the tailwater? And then think about these, uh, these tailwater rating curves and hydraulic jump rating curves, what they mean for a certain flow rate corresponding to a certain depth. You need to be able to talk your way through this uh, logical process of knowing whether the tailwater is drowning the jump or whether the jump is running downstream until it finds the appropriate amount of momentum. <coughs> okay, this is a depiction of a hydraulic jump. Upstream depth, downstream depth, Bellinger momentum equation. Here's a momentum depth diagram. If you have a, uh, okay, from this figure, can you tell what's the critical depth approximately? Remember, critical depth is associated with the minimum momentum. So it looks like here that's 0.6. 0.7, about 0.8 is the depth associated with minimum momentum. Okay, so according to this momentum depth diagram, what would be the downstream depth if your upstream depth was 0.6 meters? So the way to know that is you start at 0.6, go over, up, and then back over again. So 
the new depth would be about 1.05 meters. What we do is we find where is the point of intersection with the curve associated with the initial upstream depth and then take it over to the left to find the new downstream depth. So about 1.05 would be the Y2. Okay, now what about how supercritical is this? It's a pretty gradual transition. We're not very far to the left. So at 1, the flow is just barely supercritical, so it's not that much of a big jump. But if you had an initial flow depth of 0.3, so if we take it up to 0 0.1, 2, 3, over, and then up again, and then over to the left, this is a much more significant jump. So the delta y is the length of the line, how much the depth increased. So this line length isn't very long because we weren't very supercritical with that first case of the depth being 0.6 to begin. But now in this case, we're going from 0.3 all the way up to about 1.75. So that's a dramatic increase in depth. So the point is, is that the more supercritical you are upstream, the bigger the jump is going to be and the more energy that's lost through that transition. So we can solve for depths either graphically using momentum depth diagrams or with the Bellinger momentum equation. The interesting thing is that depending on what the Froude number is upstream, it can have different flow patterns that are relatively favorable in some instances because they don't tend to scour the bottom of the channel. But there are other Froude numbers which typically are um, avoided because the direction of the velocity vectors goes downward and interacts with the bottom of the channel. So you can see here an undular jump is one with a Froude number of between 1 and 1.7. And some of the flow velocity vectors are going down and interacting with the bed. That's not really a problem for an undular jump because the velocities are relatively low. Uh, but some of the jumps we're going to get to with a higher Froude number, if the velocity goes down towards the bottom of the channel, then it can be more of a problem if you don't have like a concrete armored um, stilling basin that you're specifically trying to cause the hydraulic jump in. So a weak jump you're more likely to see rollers at the surface rather than just ripples. Like an undular jump, you maybe wouldn't even perceive it as a hydraulic jump. It would just look like ripples in the water. But in the case of a weak jump, you are now starting to see eddies and rollers and maybe a little bit of foam in the hydraulic jump. And the, the depth will double or triple downstream. So the ratio of the downstream to the upstream depth varies between 2 and 3. So, you know, like, you can visually tease that out uh, in the case of a weak jump. Now, oscillating jumps are not great because you can see that they do go down, interact with the channel bed, and now you finally do have enough energy in an oscillating jump that uh, it could cause scour to an unlined channel. So it can cause erosion to the banks. These are considered destructive, and in location where an oscillating jump is going to form, you'd want to have a pretty well reinforced and uh, um, carefully inspected concrete stilling basin. Stable jumps have a Froude number of between 4.5 and 9, and they're good at dissipating energy because they introduce a large rise in the water surface. The ratio of the depths are between 6 and 12, and the velocity vectors are more stable than the case of an oscillating jump. So stable jumps are considered kind of like the most uh, beneficial and balanced um, hydraulic jumps for intentionally dissipating energy and avoiding too much scour at the bottom of the channel. Beyond that, beyond a Froude number of 9, then the, uh, the jump can introduce a lot of turbulence and energy dissipation. And so um, to handle... Uh, 
a strong or a rough jump would be typically pretty large and expensive and uh, something that they would want to model and study for years before putting it into practice. How long is a hydraulic jump going to be? Um, the Bureau of Reclamation, which is kind of like the federal government's um, counterpart to the Army Corps of Engineers. You know, here in the eastern part of the United States, it's the Army Corps of Engineers that manages most of the waterways that are navigable and it has the authority over like wetlands. In the western part of the United States, the Bureau of Reclamation is the dominant water resources management agency and they have built a lot of dams on federal land across the western U.S. and kind of they're the agency that manages a lot of the irrigation that's used for crop production in the West. But in any case, they have a lot of expertise having to do with hydraulics, and they came up with this nomograph that uh, tells you roughly how long the uh, hydraulic jump is likely to be. The, the length of the jump is typically longer than what you can visually see as the length of the rollers. So here, this is showing a diagram, just that what we're talking about here as far as the jump length what you'd use, the way that you'd use this figure is you'd calculate what is the froud number upstream before the jump. So for instance, if you had a froud number of four, then you'd go up, you'd intersect this curve, and you'd go to the left. And so for a froud number of four, then the ratio of L sub J to Y2 is 5.8. And so that means that the jump length is 5.8 times the downstream depth y2. So you'd need to use the Bellinger momentum equation to find out what is y2 for your scenario and then the jump length would be 5.8 times that. So this is the ratio of the jump length to the downstream depth. And this, is, this figure is typically um, used to assess the jump length but then the length of the rollers just vary from um, like 0.4 to 0.7 of the length of the jump to find the length of the rollers. This is just an empirical estimate of how long the hydraulic jump would be. Our book also mentions something called the Hager jump length equation, which uses <coughs> the Froude number upstream to also give you the ratio of the um, length of the jump, but this time to the upstream depth rather than the downstream depth. And then our book even says that there's another jump length equation. They don't even bother mentioning the name of it, but they just say there's another jump length equation which empirically estimates the jump lengths where some calibrated factor that they label A varies from 5 to 6.9. So. Um, just to show you a quick example, we've only got three minutes left, and so rather than having you calculate this, I think what I'll do is just show you the calculations. Um, water's flowing at a velocity of 5 meters per second through a channel that's 25 centimeters wide, and then the upstream depth is 10 centimeters. So in order to calculate the length of the jump, the first thing we'd need to do is find uh, the downstream depth. So let me show you that process. Okay, so this is that situation where you've got the water's flowing at 5 meters per second, upstream depth 10 centimeters, the uh, channel width is 25 centimeters. So calculating the Froude number upstream, 5.05. So it is a, uh, it is a, a supercritical flow situation upstream. And we're going to need to know the downstream depth. And so I put everything we know, including the Froude number and the upstream depth, into the um, Bellinger momentum equation and find that the downstream depth after the jump is 0.66 meters. So upstream depth was 0.1 meter, downstream depth 0.66 meters. And so from the figure, if the Froude number was 5, we go to this figure, Froude number of 5, Follow it upward, intersect to the left. That looks like it's about 6.1. What did I assess it as here in the example? I said, yes, yeah, 6.1 is the ratio of the length of the jump to Y2. So we found Y2 is 0.666 meters. 
multiply that by 6.1, so the length of the jump would be 4.06 meters. So that is the length over which it's going from its original depth to its new depth. It's not like an instantaneous thing. It's not a vertical face of water. It's a rapid increase in depth. So it's an increase in depth that's spread out over four meters in length. So if we use those other approaches, like the, uh, the Hager equation suggests 4.96 meters, and then that equation, which is called the another jump equation, suggests about three meters. So these are all just empirical estimates, and you may observe something even different from those if you're out in the field, but they give you a ballpark idea of how long the jump is going to be, and then if you have to put in armoring or if you have to line the channel, then that would tell you what distance downstream from the jump to line the channel. Okay, that's it for today. Remember that what you've got on your plate is that homework assignment. It's available now. So take a look at those hydraulic jump problems on homework 11. I'll see you on Wednesday. <laughs>